and welcome back to my podcast. This is Anne of Fiber, Floss, and Fiction. Today is January 23rd, 2023. I hope everybody's had a great kickoff to their year so far. Um, things are good here. It's actually very cold and blustery today, but we have not had very much snow. We would love Love to have some snow here in the high desert. Uh, we could definitely use the water. Um, yeah, not a whole lot going on here. We're just settled in to kind of get back to work and normal things for the beginning of the year. Um, happy January. Uh, let's see. Let's just go ahead and get, get started. I'm going to do my usual kind of three sections, yarn crafts, books and reading, and cross stitch in that order. As usual, the little cards will be in between each of those sections, so you can skip through if there's something that interests you more than something else. Um, if you are a new viewer, welcome. I'm glad that you've chosen to come and spend a little bit of time with me. And as always, to my returning viewers, welcome and welcome back. Uh, I am appreciative of the fact that you're here again to hear me talk about stuff I'm working on. Um, I think that's it for sort of admin stuff. Let's go ahead and we're going to jump right into knitting. I have two finished objects to talk about today. They both look very similar. Uh, they are from the same leftover skeins of yarn. Uh, one of them I have already gifted away to our stalwart pet sitter who loves pink, um, and I'm going to post a clip of that that I took before I took the hat over to her, but let's look at the other small one that I finished. This is a modified version of the Pussy Willow Cap. I've knit several of these, love them. They are a great way to use up uh, half a skein of sock yarn and half a skein of um, kid mohair and silk lace weight or like a Surrey alpaca. The original yarns are from McMullen Yarn Company in the colorway Desert Rose. It's the posh sock and I think it's kid silk lace is the other base. I did not have quite enough to knit this as written. It takes about 165 to 170 yards, and I had 146. I actually wound up um, finishing the top with just the mohair, maybe the last six rows or so of the decreases right there. I don't think you can really tell because it's the same color, um, but this is a little bit more beany and a little less slouchy than this pattern is actually written for. So, um, would work definitely for a smaller adult or kid, um, but I used every last yard of the sock yarn, which I am delighted about. I have been working through Stash, um, which if you've been following me for a while, has been going on for a while, and one of the things that I'm trying really hard to do is if I pull out a lone skein or the end of a skein that I'm trying to finish up, I would like to finish the whole thing and not put, you know, 146 yards back in stash. Just put something else on the needles and knit it and be done. So happy to say that this hat completed that, check that box. Um, and so now I'm going to insert a quick clip that'll just show you the other hat that I made using the exact same yarn, but a slightly different pattern. So I wanted to just do a quick FO video so that I can drop this off at my pet sitter's house as a gift. Um, this is the Evening Dew hat and I knit this version using one strand of posh sock and one strand of a kid mohair silk from McMullen Fiber Company. The colorway is Desert Rose and it's, um, sorry if you can hear the dog in the background. Um, it's just a really soft, pretty pink with some coppery highlights. I love this stitch detail. I think it's really pretty, but not very hard to work at all. And I like the shape of this hat. It's um, not super beanie, like not super tight, but it has just a little bit of extra slouchy depth here in the back. 
and uh, fits me really well, so I think it will fit her equally well. And I used about 250 yards of each yarn because obviously held together. Really like how this came out. I definitely will make more of these in the future. It's a great kind of stash busting project. And yeah, really enjoyed the knit. It was, it was fun to do and I think she's gonna appreciate the gift. So back to the regular video. So we can go on and talk about what I have currently on the needles right now. Um, I have several things on the go that I'm going to mention. Uh, I have been casting on some new projects. If I'm not very far along on them, I'm not even going to bother to show them here. I'm just going to show you the things that I've kind of been actively working on and making progress on. So the first of those is the first of the pair of self-striping socks that I have been working on. Um, I think these I had down to here or maybe just the heel turn last time. But anyway, Desert Vista Dye Works self-striping sock yarn in the colorway Time Out and Take 5. This is her Viso base, which is super wash wool and nylon combined. And then I just used some scrap sock yarn for the contrast Fish Lips Kiss heel. Um, twisted stitch ribbing. And I'm actually doing these 66 stitches around rather than my usual 64 because these are for my mom and she likes them to fit a little less snugly um, in the leg and foot. So sock one of that pair is done. And I'll cast on for sock two once I finish this pair, which are the cliff walk socks. And you can see I have one completely done. And... I am very close to finishing sock number two. So I have obviously the first one finished. I have turned the heel, put in the um, heel flap and gusset. And I have three more pattern repeats of the lace and then the toe, um, um, not bind off, but the toe decreases and bind off to do. A uh, pattern is by Helen Stewart of Curious Handmade. Again, these are the Cliff Walk socks. And I did not mean to make the modification, but I wound up only doing, I believe it's nine rounds of the ribbing as opposed to 14. I obviously just got so excited about <laughs> starting the pattern that I didn't finish all the ribbing that's called for, but I don't, I don't think it hurts these in any way. I think it looks perfectly fine. Uh, let's see. These are knit in knit on size, US size one, 2.25 millimeters, as are the self-striping socks. That's kind of my preferred sock uh, needle. And I am using sock yarn from the Woolen Rabbit from Very Deep Stash. There's Kim's card. I don't think she even uses, like, she still has this logo, but I don't think she uses this for her branding anymore. Um, sock yarn base of 8020, superwash merino and nylon. And the colorway is Pussy Willow, which is kind of a grayish blue green that I really like. It's one of my favorites of Kim's colors. I would take a sweater in that, in that color. I think it would be gorgeous. Uh, so, like I said, I am almost finished with the really pretty kind of drooping leaf motifs that are on the leg and then down onto the foot. And so hope, hope to have these finished up relatively shortly, maybe uh, even in the next night or two worth of knitting. Okay. So those are in process. I have also cast on for a new shawl and it's another Helen Stewart pattern. I don't think I have a picture. I don't. Um, it's the quill shawl and as always I'll link information down below in the description box that'll link you to patterns or books or whatever, whatever I'm talking about. Um, this is a fairly simple top-down triangular shaped shawl. It's kind of a wide triangle. It has increases here 
at the center back, you can see those, but then it also has increases along the top. And I believe the original pattern was written for DK, but I had three skeins of sport weight yarn that I wanted to use. They are all from Spun Right Round. And they are Papa Wheelie, which is the main color I'm using. Um, Hoof It, which is this chestnut brown color. And Cupy, which is the very pale, it's showing a little bit yellow here, but it's kind of a peach, very pale peach. Uh, so those are the three colors that I'm using. And so you can see I've got the main color and then the stripes, and then there's uh, some garter stitch rows that are in the, the lighter cupy, and those will also be lace eyelet rows when I get to them, not quite there. So I actually just cast this on this weekend. It's moving along pretty quickly because again, it's mostly stockinette, so just knit, knitting back and forth and working my way through that. I just am past the 10% mark on that one, thanks to Helen's handy dandy uh, pattern recipes and how she writes her patterns. Then the final thing that I just cast on uh, this morning over my tea is a new hat called Flicker and Flame. This is uh, Andrea Mowry, Drea Renee Knits. It's one of her patterns. And she has this written for either sport slash heavy fingering weight or worsted weight and I'm doing the worsted weight version. Not much to see here because literally just started it this morning on the ribbing. Very exciting. Um, but that is officially on the needles and I am using this and if anyone knows what this is please tell me because I don't. I was looking through my stash. I don't have a ton of worsted weight yarns and this popped out at me because it's a really nice neutral navy blue that I thought would work great with this, which is Dyed in the Wool's, or sorry, Spin Cycle Yarns Dream State. So it's their worsted version of Dyed in the Wool in the colorway Castaway. And it's got turquoises and grays and oranges and kind of a light dusty blue in it. So I just thought these would work great together for the pattern. And I, I don't know why this is not in my Ravelry list because I normally am pretty good about listing all of my yarns, but this one is not. Um, and obviously I've made something with it because it's a partial skein. It was about 60 grams, I think, left over. So anyway, it's a mystery, but it will be fun and it I think will work perfectly gauge-wise for for the hat and it's nice and soft. I think it's I think I vaguely remember it's merino and silk, but it's been long enough, who knows. Anyway. Okay, that Oh, two more things to quickly mention. I am working on a skein of hand spun, but that is still in the pro in process. I have got the second bobbin of singles that I'm spinning, hoping to ply that this weekend. And I'm also working on my big crochet beach walk blanket in the final descent to finish, but not quite there yet. So I will have those both to show you when they're a little closer. The beach walk, I'm gonna have to film a whole separate little video for because it's so big. I, there's just like no way to hold it up and show the whole thing. So those are coming, but they are also projects in process. Um, but that's going to do us for knit, crochet, and spinning. I have a lot of books to talk about this time. Uh, I have three finished books and a couple that I'm in the process of reading. Uh, the first book that I finished up was Cassie Clare's City of Heavenly Fire. This was the last book in the Shadowhunter series, so I think book six? Book six. Book six. Oh, sorry if you can hear the dog. Uh, this is my boxed set version from Lit Joy Crate, which has some amazing artwork and I love. Um, if you 
have not been exposed to these. These are young adult fantasy books. I've been reading the series from 2022 into 2023 with a friend. Um, Reread for me, but it's been a very long time since I had read these. So a lot of it's feeling new, even though it's not. Uh, but I love Cassie Clare. She's one of my favorite authors. As with most long series, book one and book six are definitely the best of the arc. Sometimes I feel like the middle books are like not filler, but they're just, they're slower, right? They're just advancing the plot line, but little by little. The beginning book gives you all of the world building and you in, you're introduced to the characters. And then of course, book six kind of finishes the story arc and resolves many things that were unresolved. So, um, same group of characters that we've been following through the entire City of Something set. That's all the Shadowhunters books. And I think now that we've finished these, I'm not sure if we're going to start in February or if we're going to wait till March, but we're going to read a shorter series that uh, is on um, Magnus, the Warlock, and Alec, the Shadowhunter. Um, my friend wanted to read those. I've read the first book in the series, but not the second. And so I'll reread the first and then we'll read the second one together early in this year. So if you like young adult fantasy and you don't know Cassie Clare, highly recommend, but won't talk too much about that one just because it's part of a very long series and you kind of need the whole series. There's tons of spoilers in that one. So don't want to spoil it if you're just getting started. I also finished The Western Wind by uh, Samantha Harvey. This is billed as a historical mystery, but it's really just historic fiction. There is a mystery in it, but it's not what I would consider a sort of a traditional historical mystery. Set in 1491, in rural England, there is a town where a body of a man has been found in the river. The town is kind of down on its luck. It's very small, agriculturally based, and the story is told from the perspective of their local priest. And the story is written backwards. So the first section, so it's four days, the four days around, uh, just leading up to Lent. So it starts with the last day chronologically and then works in reverse order. So you know at the beginning kind of the front end of the story that this this local um, relatively wealthy landowner has been found floating in the river and then you find out that his body disappears. And it's not really so much of a mystery in the sense that the priest knows, and you find this out as the story goes back in time, the priest knows what has happened and why this m man has been found in the river. Um, the things I liked about this book, it does a great job of setting the stage for medieval rural life, this small, small agricultural hamlet, um, kind of the everyday life lives of these people that are caught up in um, some superstition, but then also, you know, how is God influencing their lives? It's very beautifully written. The prose is great. Um, the author actually won awards for it. What I didn't like about it is I found the first section really confusing. You have no idea what's going on because you don't know any of these people. You don't know is the man in the river like part of a larger crime to be solved? Is there something kind of going on in the backstory? You just don't know. And I felt a little bit like it was almost an English class, something you would be assigned to read for English class just due to the mechanics of the writing. Uh, not to say I didn't enjoy it, but it was a it was a hard read for me. It was not light. It was not quick. It was not easy. You have to really concentrate on it. Uh, I've seen comparisons to Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose, which you may remember from a while back. 
And I do think that there are a lot of comparisons um, between these two books in terms of how they sound and the voice in them and certainly the time period and subject matter. Uh, so if you love Name of the Rose, you probably will love this one. If Name of the Rose was not your favorite or my description <laughs> sounds like you might be off put, um, this is just, this is not a super easy one to tackle, um, even though it's not, not very, very long. So I gave this about three and a half stars out of five. Not my favorite book. Glad I read it, but, um, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a struggle. And then the final book that I read, uh, was actually an audio book I finished listening to called The Confessions of Catherine de' Medici by C.W. Gortner. I've spoken about this author in the past. I really like how he writes. And interestingly, he tends to write about powerful women from the women's perspective, which I find interesting for a male author. That does not happen. Does not happen that it happens well, very often. Um, and so, sorry, just checking my texts there. Um, this one is centered on Catherine de' Medici, who was married to uh, Henri II of France. This book runs from about the end of the 1530s through till the end of the 1580s over her entire lifespan. Uh, she eventually becomes, she's from the de' Medici family, so she's from Florence. She's married into um, the French royal court, not expected to become queen, but Henri's older brother dies, so he becomes king. They wind up having several children together, but there's all this court intrigue because the king, her husband, already has a mistress, um, and she is not very well, Catherine is not very well respected at court. Her husband winds up, Henri winds up dying when he's, I believe, just 40. He's injured in a jousting tournament that he gets sick from and eventually dies, so she winds up raising their five children, three of whom become king um, as the first one is crowned and dies, the second one is crowned and dies, the third one, Henri III, winds up outliving her, but not, not by long. Um, so the book talks about that. We get introduced to Mary, Queen of Scots, who's married to her eldest son, who is the Dauphin, Henry II's son, who dies young, which is why Mary, Queen of Scots, eventually goes back to Scotland. But it's that time that Mary is at the French court and winds up kind of developing a lot of her personality and her style. It also pulls in Nostradamus, who was an advisor to Catherine de' Medici. Um, and there's a lot of other historical things going on with the French Huguenots and the religious wars, their persecution, um, the interaction with both Spain, where Philip II is on the throne, and England, where now, by the end of the book, Elizabeth I is on the throne. So it does a really great job of painting the picture of the time, tells you lots about what's going on about the history without it being like a textbook, um, and really brings Catherine de' Medici to life. And so another very good read, super entertaining. Uh, I have others by the same author kind of queued up to listen to that um, also focus on the tutors. So... More of those to come, but again, um, The Confessions of Catherine de' Medici by C.W. Gortner. Recommended read if you like historical fiction and particularly if you like Tudor, histor Tudor era historical fiction, even though this obviously is taking place in France. The final two books are ones that I am actively reading right now. Um, the first of which is this nonfiction book called Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter by Glenn Goldfarb. Uh, my husband got me this as one of the books um, for my Christmas gift this year. This was a, a nonfiction title that several uh, booktubers I follow had mentioned and really enjoyed. And so I, I was anxious to read it, but even more so after I started reading the uh, initial foreword that actually talks specifically about the Rio Galisteo Basin, which is over by Santa Fe, that way from us, 
um, and how the landscape that we see here in New Mexico currently is completely different than the landscape that was here prior to English white people settlement, um, where the beavers were pretty much decimated for the fur trade. So the book talks not only about the historical implications of the fur trade um, from, from basically as soon as the Puritans landed on the East Coast onward, um, but also how the Native Americans viewed this animal and the contributions that the beavers made to changing the topography especially here in the West where water is such a big deal. Um, you know, we don't get a lot of rainfall here. And so most of our drinking water, irrigation water, you name it, is coming from snowpacks in the mountains. And there's a lot of implications for landowners if you have a beaver who reroutes a stream or moves, a water, moves the water that's coming from a source on your property that's affecting other people. So very interesting to read about. It also goes into the natural history of the animal and um, how they build their lodges, places that they like to inhabit, um, their family unit, all that stuff. So currently reading this and enjoying that very much. And then I'm also listening to a nonfiction audiobook called The Five by Hallie Rubenhold. This was uh, a book that came out in 2019 and is, is kind of interesting. Again, actually the same two booktubers who recommended the book on beavers recommended this book. It's nominally about Jack the Ripper, but and so it's listed as a true crime book, which is not one of my favorite genres. Um, but part of the reason that I really was intrigued by this book is, is it doesn't really talk about the murders or Jack the Ripper. What it does is it looks at the five women who were the Ripper's victims and it blows up some preconceived notions about who these women were. Uh, the press indicated that they were all, you know, cheap women, prostitutes, and the Ripper probably was just going around basically picking a prostitute and slitting her throat or worse. The book goes into, um, and so I've read the introduction and I've read the first set of chapters that talk about his first victim. Um, and inside that, it's also talking about what was going on in Victorian England here in the late 1870s and into 1880, um, just around the time of the murders, from a social, social point of view, an economic point of view, um, what kind of things were driving um, how these women were being perceived. And interestingly enough, the very first victim, Polly, you know, she was, she was somebody who was by then in her 30s. She had been married. She had grown up um, in a relatively stable household. Her mother did die young, but her father kept the family together. Um, she was a woman who was actually literate, could both read and write, which was not common in that time period for women, you know, under pretty much the upper social classes, but Polly could both read and write. Um, she had been married. She and her husband had five children together. Her husband had a good job working in the print industry, in the like newspaper and book and pamphlet print industry. And, um, they had applied for and been granted a room in one of the brand new um, kind of housing settlements that had sprung up in London that had been paid for by a wealthy benefactor where they had to, you know, keep everything tidy and the husband had to have a good job and the kids were expected to go to school. So, you know, she was not somebody who was from kind of the dregs of society as the Victorian papers would have would have called her out and probably was not doing any form of solicitation in terms of prostitution. By the time that she becomes the Ripper's first victim, she is estranged from her husband. She is living on the streets and she is mostly panhandling. But it also talks about the workhouse 
um, and how the workhouse fit into uh, parish charities. Really, really interesting book. I have been, um, I was going to look and see how far, far along I am on it. Um, I'm just under 25% done with it, and I just started it Saturday. So a really good read, historical nonfiction, um, and I'll talk more about both of those next time when I hopefully will have them finished up. So let's move on. Finally today, let's talk about stitching things. Um, I have three projects to share with you, the first of which is not cross-stitching, but it is stitching. Uh, I have decided this year, sorry, dog sleeping right there, um, to do a 30 day new to me craft. And this will vary. Some things will be stitching. Some things will be other things. Um, but this month for the month of January, I decided to, uh, pick up a sashiko kit and learn how to do that. It's not a super difficult sewing or stitching technique if you've hand sewn before. Uh, it is traditionally done with the indigo cloth background and then a slightly thicker um, embroidery type cotton thread. Originally it was a mending technique uh, in Japan and it's now become slightly more decorative, which obviously this is. I picked up this little kit from a company called Snuggly Monkey there on Etsy, and it came with everything. It came with the threads, the fabric, which is pre-stamped, you can see the design on it, and needles, um, and some in instructional cards on how to do it. And I've just been, you know, putting in a thread, um, mornings over a tea break kind of thing. It's a very nice meditative craft, and I'm actually making really good progress on this. My plan is to have this finished up by the end of January. And um, I've really enjoyed it. I have some small indigo scraps and some plain white cotton. And so I think when I'm finished with this, I'm going to use it as the center of a table runner and make a like rectangle on, so add fabric on each end. And then um, just do some kind of scrap quilting uh, stripes on either side of it with the indigo scraps and just use that as a like decorative piece when I'm finished. So working on that and like I said my plan is to kind of have that finished up this month and then some other month this this year I'll use that to make the table runner and that'll be that that month's project. Okay, I did get quite a bit done on Winter's Encounter, which is my focus piece for the year. Um, I put in about 2,200 stitches the beginning of this month, and I'm working over that way. This is the full height of the pattern, so that's the top and that's the bottom. So I have to go that way with it. It's basically the size that you see inside the Q-snap. So I hit the, did I hit 50% on this? I did. I hit the 50% mark on this. So that, that felt good. Um, yeah, so I'm just working my way across that way. And I filled in this section here of his main and then the colors that I had been using up here, I just, I kept the thread threaded and I worked further down, down his body. I worked in a couple of parked threads that were down here in his leg. So this is the start of his other front leg. And yeah, this will be back out again in February, but this was my stopping point for this month. Uh, Winter's Encounter, charted by Heaven and Earth Designs and artwork is by Laura Prindle. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, the next piece is one that I started in December. It was my, it was a new start for December. I want to pull up the artwork for you guys. So it is Chesterton on blue patchwork and the artist's, um, 
the painter is Leslie Ann, uh, I never can remember her last name, Leslie Ann Ivory. So again, this is a heaven and earth design chart and it looks like my dearly departed, the divine Miss Emma, who passed away in December. This is not a very big project at all and you will see that. Um, I am working it on this little cue snap. This is the entire width right there. So it's a page and a little bit. Uh, I think there's three, three and a half columns beyond a page. So what I've been working on is focusing on getting the blue border at the top that's completely finished around there. And so then this sets my sides. And I started work on the patchwork um, hexagons, I guess they are. Uh, so I'll be working, um, my plan is to just work this down. So I'll, I'm not working like necessarily back and forth so that it's perfect rows, but I'm gonna fill in the colors and work my way down. It seems ridiculous to do anything else because it's so small. Um, and I can see all of it at once, so that's that's kind of nice. It makes it makes it really easy to do that. Um, this will be out for the rest of January. I currently have about fifteen hundred stitches in it, but I think the total stitch count is just over fifty seven thousand. It's not a very big piece by any stretch. So even though it's very long, it's not obviously very wide. So. That is my plan for the rest of this month. So you'll see that one out again, um, that I'm finishing out the month with that. I did want to mention for those of you who are interested in cross stitch and possibly full coverage cross stitch, Full Coverage Fanatics, which is a group that I administer along with Kim of Spartan Stitcher, who if you have not seen her whip parade, video that she did, you need to go check that out because she's back filming videos again. Um, and Laura, who is in Australia, and I don't know what Laura's Instagram handle is, do I? I don't think I do. Anyway, if I find that, I'll put it below, and then you can find her too. Anyway, the three of us run Full Coverage Fanatics, which is a Facebook group. We have monthly challenges um, from ones that are Themed, that you don't have to count your stitches to ones that you can count your stitches. February, we are doing our ever popular bingo card as one of the monthly challenges. So if you have a bunch of whips and want to try to get some good progress in on those, that is a great way to do it. We have several of our group members who go for all 25,000 stitches in those months that we do the, the bingo challenge, but you do not have to do that many. Um, 5,000 is gonna give you bingo, either across, down, or diagonally, or you can choose not to count and just go for the prompts that are descriptive themes um, that are on the bingo card. So if you're interested, please feel free to join that group. Um, all of our groups are set up, all of our events are set up in that group um, with supporting files and information and timing and all that good stuff. Okay. I think that is it for me today. Uh, I managed to zoom through things pretty quickly. I hope everybody, like I said, is having a great start to your January, um, that you're enjoying whatever the season brings for you at your corner of the world. Uh, I will be back in a couple of weeks, so probably it'll be February already by the time, next time I record. Um, so I hope everybody is staying well, staying safe, uh, enjoying your crafty time, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.